Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, looks like a few more people are joining in right now, which is good. Um, we'll get started, though. And today we're going to be talking about how to use plastic assembly technologies to extend the boundaries of 3D printing. Um, and our presenter today is Kyle Harvey, uh, the business unit manager for our additive manufacturing group. Kyle has been with Extol for over 11 years. And he has a wealth of knowledge uh, in both plastic assembly technologies like welding plastic and assembling plastic. And he's also obviously well versed in additive manufacturing as he leads that cell. Um, before we get started, I wanted to point out some of you have found it already. There's a chat feature. Um, there's a little chat um, button near the top of your screen. It probably has a little orange dot if you haven't clicked on it already. You can have that up on the side and use it to type in questions throughout the presentation. Um, to get everybody started, why doesn't everybody go there and just tell us where you're joining from today? And then one thing that you are hoping to learn from this presentation. So as you guys start putting those in, we'll get started. Kyle, take it away. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome today. Uh, we're really excited to have you. We've got people from all over the world uh, sign up for this webinar. So pretty cool to share this with all of you today. And really our goal today is to expand your thoughts of what's possible by combining plastic assembly and 3D printing. And hopefully we'll give you some tools that'll help you get out of some of those uh, tricky situations and problems with either prototyping or launch timing, um, making functional prototype parts, and maybe even some ideas for production applications for 3D printing. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna cover a lot today. We're gonna move pretty quickly. Um, and there's really kind of three sections of this presentation. First, we'll talk about why do 3D printed parts need to be assembled in the first place? What's the need for them? Then we'll look at 15 different assembly examples of HP MJF 3D printing. Then we'll kind of wrap up and give you some keys to success to walk away from. And I just want to encourage you guys to ask questions throughout. There's a lot of content here. We do have a lot to get through, but um, we'll have some time to answer questions as we go and, and kind of the best way to answer some of those questions is while we're on the topic. So if we uh, if we slow down too much, uh, we'll, we'll kick it in gear and pick up the pace and um, I'll let you know if we need to do that. So yeah, get, get your questions in that chat as we go. All right, a really quick intro and background on Axel for, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar and for some context to help tie all of this together. Um, Axel is a manufacturing technology company that improves the way plastic products are made. Really, we serve our customers across three, three main areas of our business. One is additive manufacturing and 3D printing, where we provide 3D printed parts for prototyping, um, developing, and help our customers develop and scale production applications. Second is plastic assembly technology. So there's several different ways to weld and, and assemble plastic. Um, we have several uh, proprietary technologies for doing doing that and are certainly well versed with uh, all of them that are offered in the industry as well. And then third is custom automation where we um, build equipment and assembly lines that go into our customers factories and often those integrate um, some of that plastic assembly technology and even a lot of uh, 3D printing components end up on those those machines as well. And we serve customers in those areas. Um, and customers across all different industries, automotive, life science, consumer products. And the thing that all those different customers have in common is that they're all designing and manufacturing plastic parts. So that's kind of the common thread across all of our customers. Um, so as we start to dig into the meat here today, um, I wanna introduce this framework that'll guide some of our, our activity and thinking. Um, and this is a framework to think about manufacturing plastic products. So. We'll first use this to discuss traditional manufacturing and, and then expand it into how we can use it to think about additive manufacturing as well. And, and so um, really in this idea of plastic product manufacturing, um, things start with a primary process, right? Like things like injection molding, blow molding, extrusion. Um, cer certainly there's others that could be in this list of primary manufacturing process as well. Um, but all those processes have some limitations and, and most products require some secondary process to achieve a final product. And so 
you know, over the years, many secondary processes have been created to, to assemble product and transform plastic parts into that final product. And there's many assembly options depending on the material compatibility and application requirements for those applications. And really they break down into two categories. First category is mechanical assembly methods. So these are things like um, screws, snap fits, tongue grooves, um, staking, brass inserts, things like that, where we're, we're using mechanical um, retention to join materials. And those materials can be dissimilar, right? We can join a metal part to a plastic part or maybe a circuit board to a plastic part, things like that. I, um, the other big category is materials that are compatible and capable of joining a molecular bond together. So this can be done with processes like adhesives, extrusion welding, ultrasonic welding, hot plate welding, um, laser welding, spin welding, vibration welding, and, and you know there, there's even more out there than this. But um, though that really depends on compatible materials, materials that like each other and will actually bond on a molecular level when they're they're melted or or joined together. And then we introduce this this uh, atom manufacturing as another primary process for plastic product manufacturing. And the dream is really that this process can go all the way through and just print the final part right from the beginning. But that's just not reality today, right? We're a long ways from that, and uh, that's what we we think of as our first instinct of what we want to happen. But it's a, it's a long way from that. <clears throat> so in reality, all of uh, added added manufacturing, just think of it as another primary process, another way to make an initial part that we have to do some work to turn it into a final product. So that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today: is how might we achieve that. So why, why in 3D printing, you know, what's the gap? Why are the things that we can't just go and print the final part right away? And really, um, it falls on a spectrum for sure. And sometimes it's um, constraints in 3D printing that, that don't allow us to directly manufacture the final part and that requires some joining. And sometimes there's opportunities actually that we want to take advantage of by splitting parts and combining them back together into the assembly. So. Um, you know, constraints, things like how big a printable size, limitations of the printers and things like that. Um, for powder-based processes, we have to get the powder out of them um, before they're, they're turned into the final part. Um, sometimes we want to combine multiple materials in an assembly and we need to um, join parts because of that. Um, moving up into opportunities, things like prototyping with a production process so we can mimic as close to production as possible. Then um, sometimes there's opportunities to optimize printing and be beyond even just optimizing the printing of the part, sometimes we can optimize the whole system. And we talk about things like hybrid manufacturing, which we'll see some of those examples today where we can use different primary manufacturing processes to combine different parts and create a, a holistic assembly that's optimized. So as we look back at this, you know, some 3D printing processes play better with different secondary assembly processes than others. So the good news is what we're going to talk about today is HPMJF, and that works really, really well with uh, all of these pro all of these type of secondary assembly processes. And to understand why, it's really important to understand the basics of how the MJF 3D printing technology works and why welding assembly is kind of a natural extension of that. And so first thing to understand about um, MJF 3D printing is that we're printing things in a build box. So you see this upper right hand corner, um, these are halves of a fluid reservoir kind of dispersed throughout the build. That build is 15 inches by 15 inches by 11 inches uh, to create the, the build volume where we drop in all those parts and then we're building those parts layer by layer. So um, MJF is a, a powder based, a plastic powder based process. Um, so we're starting with a plastic powder and the first step that powder is layered and spread out evenly in a, 
a very thin layer, about 80 microns um, in a layer. Next, we apply fusing and detailing agents. Um, there's two different agents that are applied. The fusion agent is represented by the black droplets here. That's getting applied where we want the part to grow in that layer, and we want to actually melt and fuse those powder particles together. The detailing agent gets applied next to it, um, which is something that helps us create a nice crisp edge on the part that we're, we're building. After that, a infrared lamp comes across and where the darker fusing agent has been applied, that uh, extends the material across the melting point and actually fuses that material together and um, joins it not only to all the other particles on that layer, but to the layer below it as well. And then we end up with a fused part. So when we, we think about what's happening here, really we're, we're doing kind of mini welds layer by layer to build up this plastic part. So that works out really nicely when we, we start to look at how we can use it with other welding technologies and things like that. So th those characteristics result in some really important properties um, and fundamentals for MJF parts. And one is that we can build parts that are non-porous. So Parts hold liquid and air, um, which can be critical for some functional assemblies and applications. The second characteristic is that MJF results in a thermoplastic part. So we can remelt parts I and mean, we can weld it with a molecular bond to other compatible thermoplastics. And these are not things to keep for granted. Not every uh, 3D printing technology that's out there is capable of this. And so really makes MJF uniquely suited to make great functional assemblies. All right, bumping over from the, the 3D printing side of things and, and thinking about what makes a successful plastic assembly application, it, it really a full solution has to come together, right? Um, included some of the different areas here that we need to think about when we put together a plastic assembly, you know, things like process engineering, the right fixtures and tooling, the right equipment or joining technology that we're using. We need to make sure materials are compatible and that that those work with the different welding processes, and then certainly part design is a huge part of it. And so you know, welding assembly is, is kind of easy on paper, but the devil's really in the details. And as these gears turn, you kind of get one, one gear that's stuck or uh, not optimized, and that just throws off the whole solution. So something we need to keep in mind as we're, we're talking through the rest of this. So we're gonna use this framework as a guide to talk through several different assembly examples with 3D printed parts. First, we're gonna focus on mechanical retention and we'll start with the snap fit. So, you know, a snap fit is probably the, one of the simplest plastic joining methods. And to make that happen, ductility is really, really key. And there's many types of different snap designs. Um, this is an example of a Christmas tree fastener application that was actually in the early days of, of COVID um, for a respirator project that we were working with for our customers, that this was actually a production application where we made 28,000 pieces of this fastener in three weeks, printing with HP MJF and in particular polypropylene. Um, the polypropylene uh, allowed for a good ductility that actually made this application work. Next, tongue and groove. So, Tongue and groove joint is something that's been around you know, for centuries being used to make assemblies. Um, this is an example of a prototype automotive exterior co cartridge for an OEM customer. In this case, we need to build about 48 pieces of these in, in 15 days. And this was a, a pretty large part. Um, I saw a question of, can we get a file after meeting? Yeah, we'll send this out. So no need to furiously take notes uh, we'll, we'll share the, the presentation. Um, so this is a rather large part, and if we're going to print it in one piece, you can see in the, the picture there, one piece barely fit kind of kitty corner across that build. And so just printing that one piece and then doing 48 of them would result in a long lead time and a, a pretty high cost because we're not optimizing the build as good as we, we would be able to. So in this case, splitting that part into two sections instead of printing as one actually allowed us to get about eight times more efficient in our build packing and 
um, we could fit six sets in a build instead of just one. And that that six sets wasn't even the full height of a build. So that's where we get to eight times more efficiency. This allowed us to meet the cost and timing requirements for our customers. And th this is a good example where um, splitting parts is really count counterintuitive to the one of the main benefits of 3D printing that's often talked about, which is consolidating assemblies and consolidating parts. Axtel, we actually find that we're more often splitting parts and then assembling them after printing um, than we are combining parts to make a, a value proposition for 3D printing. So really counterintuitive to maybe what's preached out there a lot. And I think the fear in that is knowing how is the best way to get these back together. And you got to have a lot of tools in your toolbox to be able to do that and get it together the right way. So once you kind of overcome that fear and, and you can split it, um, you can be comfortable with how it's going to go back together. And so here's a here's a closer look at the joint and what that looked like. So again, this is the tongue and groove joint uh, locked in position with a dowel. And that dowel was secured uh, here by welding the hole closed. So um, in this case, we added to the, the B surface of the part. We have plenty of room to add material there and, and design this joint. So the joint would be stronger than the parent material around it. And this thing is rock solid. Um, the part around it would definitely break before the joint will break. Jason, I see a question. Yeah. Can you comment on the print time for the one full part that wasn't split yep. versus the six sets? So the print time is the same. So that's that's one of the key things with MJF is we're putting down layer by layer. And so that's a main difference between maybe a FDM 3D printing process and a, um, a powder based process like this. Um, the print time to print one is 12 hours and to print six is 12 hours. And that's why it's really important to put as much into that build as we can possibly fit. Um, to optimize that utilization because it's going to take the same amount of time based on the height, right? So um, we could print, you know, if you only print an hour, uh, that's a, maybe only a partial build. Um, but as the height goes up, the printing time goes up as well. Great question. All right, staking. So um, this is another polypropylene example assembled with Axel's patented staking technology called NanoStake. Uh, we'll see a video of that here in a second, but this is NanoStake's really well suited for smaller bosses. And um, staking is really, think of it as replacing a, a rivet or a screw in an assembly and removing that component from your build materials and just using the base plastics that is there to create that permanent rivet in the plastic. So staking is often used with dissimilar materials to join things like plastic to a circuit board or a piece of metal or um, something like that where, where there's dissimilar materials. And in this case, uh, this is a video of a sample plaque where that washer represents a dissimilar material. That's a nylon washer being joined to a polypropylene sample plaque. So again, this is a, a polypropylene MJF part. All right, moving on to the last mechanical assembly method, brass inserts. Um, this is a, an example from the NanoStake product line that you just saw. And that product line actually has 10 end-use printed components in production on it. So this is one of those components is the uh, housing um, or some of the controls. And in this case, um, we needed to join a metal cover to this printed plastic housing that is printed in PA12. And we needed that to be um, something that was serviceable. So we needed some bolts to, to assemble it. And in this case, this is an M4, uh, I believe, M4 um, brass insert that's being put in. Um, sometimes threads can actually be printed into the MJF part as well. 
down to about an M6 bolt. That works really well, but smaller than that, um, brass inserts are the, the key. So um, here's a video of the brass inserts actually being installed to that part. All right, so now we're going to move into these different welding processes that require compatible materials and a molecular bond. The first one we're going to start off here with is extrusion welding. This is an example of a, a polypropylene fluid reservoir, and we'll see this a little bit later with hot plate welding as well. But in this case, one to 10 assemblies um, were needed and, and that's low, fairly low volume, right? And doesn't justify building tooling like we might have for hot plate welding a little bit later. It would really increase the cost of the application. Um, but we need a hermetic seal and we need to have something we can pressurize. We need a, a burst strength um, that we need to hold for this part. And so um, we're able to print in two halves like, like so and then do the extrusion welding or, or drainer welding, some people might know that, that brand name and um, connect the two assemblies together and permanently join them. So here's a video of that welding process. So as that cools off now, we've got a, a functional assembly that's sealed, um, will not leak air or water, and will maintain a, a pretty high burst pressure, high enough where if we burst it, it's not going to come apart at the weld. It will actually break in the parent material of the part. And this is a process that can be done with very large parts, right? And so um, not just parts that sit inside of the um, can can fit in one piece inside of the printing volume, but you know, think of like an instrument panel or something very large like that. Okay, another, another extrusion welding example is an automotive B-pillar. So again, this is a pretty large uh, assembly that won't fit in one piece in a build, and so we had to break it apart. And um, in this case, we, we welded the joints uh, here show a video of that, um, resulting in a smooth backside. So you can see, in this case, we designed in, again, some more clips or snaps that hold the assembly in place while we're doing the welding process. So that becomes kind of our built-in fixture to the part. And you get a nice smooth surface on the, the A side of that as well. All right, moving on to ultrasonic welding. Um, you know, ultrasonic welding is, is the most common welding in the world of plastics. Um, so if you haven't heard of any type of welding at all, maybe ultrasonic is the one you've heard of. And today, you know, there's several different types of ultrasonic welding. We're going to just look at spot welding and um, here's another way to do that same B-pillar assembly. Um, in this, instead of welding all the way across that joint, we're going to spot weld it, and we've designed an overlapping joint that gives us material to spot weld from one half to the other. And again, this is something that can achieve parent material strength 
and uh, make the joint just as strong as the material around it. So fitting the parts together there, this is something that can definitely benefit also from the built-in snaps like we had in the extrusion welding. Um, ultrasonic welding, this is a 40 kilohertz unit, that, so the tip of that is vibrating at 40,000 times a second at maybe a couple of thousandths of amplitude. So very high frequency, very low amplitude, and ex uh, exciting the actual molecules in the plastic to the point where they heat up and melt and join each other. Um, good question there. Are there any any opportunities or ways to improve the joint of the aesthetics of a, the joint of extrusion welding? Um, it's not it's not a pretty process, as you saw. Um, you know, maybe the best thing to do would be able to design a cover to kind of snap in over the top of it after it's assembled. Um, there is also the potential for kind of remelting it and smoothing it out. We've had varying degrees of success of that. Um, it's not something that's super dependable. So kind of really depends on that joint design, but if aesthetics were important, that's something you'd want to consider of how do you optimize that joint design to make sure you get the aesthetic that you need. All right, Scott, good question. Why does it darken the, the plastic? So um, it is actually revealing the the black internal of the plastic. So if we go if we go back to the way MJF works, um, the powder that you start off with is white, and the parts look gray because of the fusing agent that we put onto it is basically a carbon black fusing agent. So that is taking that white powder and turning it to to black. If you cut open an MJF part, the inside of it would be it would be black because of that fusing agent. The reason it's a little bit gray on the outside is because that's the boundary layer between the white powder that was not fused and the um, the black fused part on the inside. So when we're welding it, like the extrusion welding, we're using a black rod. Um, so that's simply why it is. But we'll see even later, um, I guess, with the ultrasonic welding that you saw in this example, it looks like it's turning black, but that's just because it's really revealing the black that is under that that boundary layer of kind of the stipple of the gray powder that's in the asphalt. Hopefully that helps, Scott. All right, here's an example of a different ultrasonic welding application um, beyond just splitting where we're, our, our OEM customer welded sensor brackets to a much larger component. So this, this is where we get into the idea of hybrid manufacturing. These were components that were 3D printing the sensor bracket, they knew they were gonna to have to go through a lot of design iterations and um, try a whole bunch of different sensors and, and mounting styles. And so um, it was just wasn't gonna be practical for them to tool up each of those different styles. So in this case, there was 22 unique versions of this bracket and um, we ended up printing over 2,500 individual pieces for this application. And um, so these were the printed component the, the larger component was actually a injection molded component that was much larger and was tooled already. And the printed component was welded to that larger polypropylene injection molded component with ultrasonic welding and spot weld. So you can kind of see those here in, in these, um, the flatter, thinner areas of that, that assembly the, would be welded to that larger injection molded part. So, um, a great thing to think about in development, where is the complexity? Um, that is a great place to think about for additive manufacturing and using the flexibility of it to you drive iterations quickly before you have to move to um, move to fixed tooling where you're, you're making investments and the cost of change is now really high. Another ultrasonic welding example, this is from the world of orthotics. Um, this is on a scoliosis brace application for a customer uh, named Fitted. So this is, these are pretty big parts. Picture, um, this goes around the torso of most often a, a teenager. 
um, who is battling scoliosis. So um, this is something that is a pretty large part, right? And we have to split it to reduce cost. And then we also need a scalable assembly method because this is something that is launching to production and um, using adhesives at this scale is not something that is too fun for any of you that have experienced it. And so um, this we ended up with about 100 welds per assembly. And we'll take a look at some of the bend strength, but the, the joint strength was almost 400 newtons um, for each joint that we had. So if we look again at this, right, of um, when we first got this, it was about eight pieces per brace. And again, with the idea of minimizing assembly, the intent was to use glue, um, but it did not optimize the build area, which a lot of the cost is driven by how much of that build area and build volume are we optimizing. And so through breaking it down into 15 more pieces, we added, yes, incrementally, incrementally more assembly, but drastically improved the efficiency of our build packing. So, um, you know, basically cut the cost of the printing portion of this in half by doubling the efficiency of the printing. So a close-up of those, um, the, each of the, the sections has these jigsaw puzzles on them. And on the, the outside surface that's not contacting the patient is the B surface. And that's where we're actually ultrasonic spot welding each of these, these joints together and several welds per joint here. Um, taking a look at the, the bend testing, um, in the bend testing, the the welded joints outperform the adhesive. So not only is it easier to assemble, but it's more cost, more cost effective and um, it's a, a stronger joint that it results in as well. I'll play that video again, it goes fast. But adhesive tends to be really, really brittle in joints like this. So the great thing about polypropylene is the joint is being joined by the polypropylene itself. So we get that ductility still in the joint that we're used to having um, in a polypropylene part, and we don't kind of mess that up with a really brittle adhesive. And part of what breaks in this is actually the parent material of some of those jigsaws as well. What typical gap would you have between the puzzle parts? Great question. Um, a, about 10 thousandths is a really, really good gap. Um, it depends on the design, uh, what the overall constraints how many sort of degrees of freedom that you have in those. Um, it's the tighter, the better, but you have to be able to get it together. So, um, you know, somewhere in five to 10 thousandths is really good. Um, line to line, you need to get the hammer out. I'm sorry, 10 thousandths of an inch, which would be about 0.25 millimeters. Thanks for all you metric people. <laughs> Thanks for asking. All right, hot plate welding. Okay, here's an example of a, a fluid reservoir. Um, welded an x folds rapid conductor. And again, similar to the extrusion welding we saw before, but this case now we need a much more repeatable part and we're gonna, we're gonna make more of them. And so um, doing them all by hand is not, uh, Maybe as repeatable or as efficient. And so we needed the functional prototype, but we couldn't print it in one piece because we needed to get the powder out of the inside. Um, often these types of res reservoirs have different um, bevels or, or things on the inside. Bellows is the word I'm looking for, I guess, that uh, traps fluid in different areas or keeps it from sloshing around. And so those internal cavities would make it impossible to get the powder out of. It needs to be made in two pieces. Again, we can produce a hermetic seal and achieve a burst strength that achieves the parent material apart. So here's an example of a part that's been burst. Um, again, these are printed in MJF polypropylene, hot plate welded, then burst tested, which is common for this type of part. Uh, it's a common testing method. And one thing we always want to see with hot plate welding is that we're breaking away from the weld then we and breaking out the parent material because we know that then the weld is as strong as we can get it 
and if we need to make the parent material stronger, we need to go back and um, you know do do the design change and tweak the part design if needed. But the weld is as good as we can get it. So this is what we expect to see in molded parts, and we see the same thing in welding MJF polypropylene parts as well. Here's a video of that welding process. The, the MJF parts go into the fixtures. The weld ribs on those parts then actually touch off on this horizontal plate, which is about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what is melting those weld ribs before the parts are being joined back together. Now they're joined back together. Um, again, to Scott's question earlier, you can see that the black melted portion in the middle of those weld ribs is actually revealed and that's what has been heated and melted. The parts are put together under force and held until they re-solidify and then that's what creates that strong molecular bond and parts are permanently joined together. So it, we have a lot of customers with these types of applications that we work with in the plastic assembly side of our business and typically um, you know we're making the production tooling for them and, and equipment um, so we end up working with them on the prototype portions of that as well where they're injection molding the prototypes um, they send it to us for hot plate welding extol because maybe they're they haven't ordered their equipment or they're not ready for it on their factory floor yet and they just need say 100 prototype assemblies um, so we get the, the molded parts from them do the welding and extol and prototype tooling in a day and then send them out for validation testing so you know for them waiting seven to 12 weeks for injection mold to get 100 parts is very common um, in the world of additive uh, we've been able to drastically reduce that so we've had um, several customers now coming to the, us with you know maybe they want to do a faster iteration they don't quite need 100 assemblies yet maybe they want 10 or 20 to get some parts on vehicles and start testing sooner and we can print those in you know six days instead of over seven weeks again the same one day of hot plate welding and it's off to them for validation testing and functional parts that are going on vehicles so a, a huge difference in time savings of their development there um, here's a head-to-head -head comparison for uh, one application we did of injection mold parts versus mjf parts for these fluid reservoirs um, see both achieved a hermetic seal the burst strength on the injection molded parts was a bit higher, but the MJF parts still met the requirement. Uh, both achieved the parent material strength in that burst test, and the lead time's the kicker, right? This is the this is the the thing that really freed up our customer to do more iterations more quickly. So think about this, right? What 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 if you could do an iteration in a week in your design process, a week to get a functional prototype instead of waiting uh, months for a prototype? Um, again, with hot plate welding, this is a TPU uh, sample. You know, again, reason to split parts, maybe to to fit parts in a build or reduce cost um, or allow powder removal. Same things we we talked through earlier. So, this TPU can be hot plate welded as well, um, and strength-wise we can meet parent material with that just like the others um here's a it's a video of a part that's been welded um, this tpu is a super super tough material um flexible but again the weld not something we could even get apart by hand tpu is really really tear resistant and the beast of a material in the tensile tests, again, achieving the parent material strength. Well, a question, what's the process time per unit of hot plate welding? So once we have it all set up, um, the cycle time, you saw it in that video. So, um, you know, 20 to 30 seconds is really common for a hot plate welding cycle. All right, laser welding. Um, another fluid reservoir type application, but in this case, it's another hybrid manufacturing application where the, the base material was an MJF polypropylene 3D printed. 
but they're joined to an extruded, traditionally manufactured polypropylene sheet. Because these are compatible materials, we can join them together even though they are made with different primary manufacturing processes. So in this case, um, the translucent polypropylene was important because we wanted a visible fluid level and you know, MJF is, is a opaque, results in an opaque color, and so we could not see through it. But by adding this window with um, the translucent extruded polypropylene, we could get that performance. So, and again, needed to be hermetic seal and achieve uh, a certain burst test. Here's a video of the welding process for laser welding. Um, parts are put into the fixture, they're clamped together up against the glass. The laser um, quasi simultaneously welds, which means goes around multiple multiple cycles and melts the extruded polypropylene sheet to the, the base polypropylene that's been 3D printed. The laser is actually passing through that upper translucent layer and absorbing into the bottom layer at the weld joint, and that's what's heating and melting the parts together. Jason, I saw a question. Yeah, is it, is it possible to use PA nylon in both parts, the transparent without CB? I'm not sure what CB. Oh, carbon black. Carbon black, thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, um, PA12 will also weld to PA12 um, that, that's printed outside of 3D printing. Yeah, there there's... Um, even two parts that are that look black may be able to be welded together if the the top part is actually specially engineered with the material additives to allow the translucent um, the transparency of the laser wavelength to pass through it. So a lot going on there, but yes, yeah, certainly possible. So again, we, we touched on that hybrid manufacturing idea, right? And when we when we look at optimizing systems, hybrid manufacturing is a really good option to do that, much like the ultrasonic welding example that we looked at earlier, um, where we can combine manufacturing processes to use each where they have benefits and, and they're good and have strengths and they can complement each other. So um, in this case, you know, think of think of something like a commonized polypropylene substrate. It's your molded or thermoformed, extruded, et cetera, produced with a low cost manufacturing process that we can make a lot of them cheap. Um, and then adding features to that that are made with 3D printing, um, but could be joined to that, that low cost substrate, right? So with 3D printing, we could do customization, um, many different variations of different models or assembly types and things like that, that we can put high value features, complex features in localized places, and maybe even make those different for every part that we make. And then combining those together, we can get a, an optimized assembly and a whole optimized system to create the most value. So this can be done for both prototyping and production. All right, spin welding. Um, this is a canister assembly that's been spin welded. I'm printed with PA12. In this case, our customer wanted to make a, a joint design change. They already had the mold tool kicked off. They needed to make some changes. They wanted to validate those design changes before spending a whole bunch of money updating their, their mold tool. So we, in this case, we could validate that joint design with the 3D printed part. And again, pass the burst test. Um, in this case, this is a 3D printed reservoir for an automotive OEM. Um, the requirements were hermetic seal and had to hold a very high pressure. And this application actually came to us after they had first done the assemblies with glue and had an explosion, a pipe bomb basically, because the adhesive didn't hold. So definite safety issue potentially there. Um, you can see a pretty simple process is a friction process where one part is clamped against another under force in that circular joint and then spun together to create friction and that melts the joints together. I saw a comment about clear weld mm -hmm. up there. 
Yeah. Maybe I mis, mis answered the question earlier. Well, so yes, there's a product called Clear Weld that allows for laser welding to clear parts. There's also uh, different wavelengths of laser that can weld to clear parts without an additive as well. Yeah, so if the question was, can you weld two clear parts together? Yes, um, clear weld or two micron laser, um, which is a different wavelength of laser than, than what you saw used for, for that application is definitely achievable. And uh, if you got an application like that, we can help you out. All right, last one, vibration welding. So we're getting to the end here. We'll have some time for questions. So this is an automotive engine duck. Um, Printed in PA12, this was this was created because um, this was a prototype part for welding fixture validation. So the the nylon molded parts were not ready, but the weld tooling needed to be validated in the vibration welder, and the whole project was on a really tight timeline. So in this case, we were able to print weldable parts in PA12, um, and they could actually do that that validation as they could prove out tooling with the injection molded parts. So save themselves a whole bunch of time there. Um, here's a video of the vibration welding process. So the two parts are clamped together. Um, in vibration welding, the frequency is about 240 hertz. And so then it's moving at about two millimeters of amplitude. So these parts are scrubbing against each other. Um, moving against each other again, creating that friction and heat, which melts the parts together. This was really successful for our customers. Again, produce the part that was um, e equal to an injection molded part, but more importantly, allowed them to set up that, mold, that assembly tooling and validate and run off the vibration welder. All right, so we threw a lot at you fast there. We, we looked at 15 different applications for welding and assembly of 3D printed parts um, that cover a whole broad range of requirements and solutions. And you know, just, just calling us back to this and remind, keep an eye out for when assembly is required or can really help achieve uh, some of these things or, or opportunities that we talked of. And it can be counterintuitive at times, right? Combining parts and printing it, as one is not always the best solution. Like I said, we often find ourselves breaking things into multiple pieces uh, to, to meet the requirements of the application. Here's a little cheat sheet of um, all these different processes for joining 3D printed parts. We talked about all these different categories, but some, some areas here where you might be able to um, understand the requirements for your application and figure out which which joining methods might be the most suitable. And uh, you can hurry up and screenshot this or this will be included and we can send you a copy in the presentation as well. And then another reminder, right? Successful application requires tying all these things together. So the devil's in the details. Um, so whether, if you're going to do this on your own or get some help from someone like Axtol, uh, make sure you have all these bases covered and uh, can get to a complete solution. So that's it. Uh, if you get in one of these applications with 3D printing or plastic assembly or, or the combination, please, please reach out. Um, again, we can provide parts for prototyping, production, and help guide you to a successful project. And even if you don't have anything right now, connect, reach out and connect on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow along there. We're frequently sharing a lot of new insights on both plastic assembly and 3D printing. Yeah. So Jason, I saw a couple of questions. Yep. Going. What do we got? So um, the one question was, how do you decide uh, the which is the best technology for welding of their particular part? Um, you know, vibration welding or hot plate welding. How do you choose between different methods? Yeah. So a lot goes into that. Um, for this, right, we'll focus on how do we choose in a 3D printing use case. Um, that was some of the thought process of putting this together was here are some different things that you might want to be important or, you, or different categories that might be important for different applications that might guide you to a different solution, right? If you need a really um, flexible process because it's, 
it's manual and doesn't require well tooling you know there there's some lower volume applications that might really make sense for that right if you gotta make a whole bunch of parts you might want to think more about scaling something into more of an automated process which might lead you to hot plate welding or laser welding or something like that um you know compared to like extrusion welding which is more manual and not a good way to scale parts so yeah the part volume matters the requirements matter aesthetics matter somebody brought that up earlier um all, all those things will help point you to the right one and and ultimately that's what we're here for right this, we've got 35 years of experience of doing this uh picking the right plastic assembly technology for the application so we can rely on a lot of that experience and help you out one of the questions that we got earlier um as as some something somebody was hoping to learn is can you 3d print any materials that are soluble in water or anything else kind of an interesting question soluble in water so there's there's you know mjf is one 3d printing technology out of dozens that are out there on the market um there are materials that print water soluble parts and some of those are actually used to print supports so you can get rid of the supports in the wall and by just uh, dunking them in water. That's a whole nother rabbit trail maybe to go down for different 3D printing technologies. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's out there. I would say search it. Um, not something with MJF that we can do. Between vibration welding and spin welding, which process is better for part cleanliness? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, neither. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're both friction processes, which um, there's inherent scrubbing of the parts, right? And so, with that, there's debris that comes off. Um, you get some kind of hairy joints and flash and debris that comes off that. If you're looking for clean, uh, laser welding is as clean as it gets. So hot plate welding is, is definitely cleaner than, um, than vibration or spin welding, um, but you're still touching off on a, on a heated tool, which um, depending on what your definition of clean is, there's there's something extra kind of introduced there. Mm -hmm. If you laser welding, no, it's the the joint is the joint. There's nothing else going in between it, and that's as clean as it gets and yeah. precise. I would say spin welding too. You can there are things you can do with your joint design to trap as much of that particulate that's going to be generated. But I don't know that you can say that it's going to be 100 percent that yeah. you're not you're not going to trap all of it. So yeah. and and really picking between spin welding and vibration welding, is, that's a question of joint type. Spin welding, you need a circular joint mm -hmm. and vibration welding, you need a linear joint, which is the opposite of circular. Yeah. So you can find a way to get a hold of us. You can go to our website and contact us that way. There's lots of ways to get a hold of us. Just reply to the email that we send. But um, hopefully everybody found this informative and helpful and thank you for the um, the thanks and the great webinars in the chat I appreciate that we appreciate that yeah um, as, as you guys are leaving you know what I guess um, what's on your mind for what's next right is there more content you want to see um, kind of a follow-up webinar to this maybe if there is an area you want us to dive into more uh, let us know and we'd love to take a look at that and maybe uh, maybe share that next time so Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. Have a good one.